This morning, I'm excited to share with you a story uh, that I came across quite some time ago, and it's just really spoken to me, and I wanted to share it with you. And, you know, a lot of times when we think of Mother's Day, and when we think of, I remember when I found out that I was expecting with Madri our first, it was so exciting, and you have these wonderful, you know, you get that what to, do, what to expect when you're expecting, now you just like... Uh, Googles it, Google it, and all the names and everything, and you have these imaginary thoughts of how flowery it's going to be, how wonderful it's going to be, how many cuddles you're going to get, how many times it's just going to be like a beautiful flower garden, and you are so excited, a beautiful pencil edged flower, so calm, so lovely, so, so wonderful. And then, all of a sudden, you realize it is not a beautiful flower garden. It's a jungle out there. It's a little crazy out there. And so this morning, we're going to talk about it's a jungle out there. And I'm going to remove the jungle hat. This is my father-in-law's Air Force hat, and so I borrowed it, but I'm afraid the uh, shadows might be a little too much. So this morning, we're going to talk about it's a jungle out there. And I want us to just ask the Lord to be with us because he's going to teach us, hopefully, some things from this story. Father, we come before you on a special day. Really, Lord, you created this day because you created motherhood. It was your design. Unfortunately, sometimes we haven't done the best with that. But then again, there have been times when you have shown beautifully and your glory has been seen through it. Lord, I just ask you this morning that you would anoint all of us to hear your word, to open our eyes, to see, to hear, to know what you want to say to each one of us individually. For Lord, you have a message for us today. So put a guard at my mouth. There's a lot of things I want to say, but let there be things that you want said in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. On December 24th, 1971, a lady, uh, uh, actually a teenage girl, 17 years old, by the name of Juliana Kopke, got on a plane with her mother in Lima, Peru. On that plane, they were leaving uh, her graduation. She had just graduated from high school on the 22nd. On the 23rd, she begged her mom, can we please stay over one more day because I want to go to the prom. And so this is an actual picture of her at her prom the night on, on December 23rd. On December 24th, they got on a plane because then they were flying so that they could meet up with her dad, and, and so they were going to be together for Christmas, and so they got on this plane, Christmas packages everywhere, lots of excitement in the air as they were getting ready to go celebrate Christmas, and they got on this plane, and it was Lansa Flight 508, and they were so excited, and they were in a row of three seats, and Juliana loved to sit and, on the end, and so she had the window seat, and then her mother was next to her, and then there was a gentleman that they didn't know in the third seat. And the plane had been delayed for a little while because of storms. And, and eventually, after several hours of delay, they actually were able to take off, and they started flying, and the storm came back. And there was lightning everywhere, and there were uh, thunder and, and the, the turbulence in the plane. And all of a sudden, midway through this flight, there was a bright light outside of her window and lightning had struck the plane. She remembers her mother saying, it's over now. And that's the last thing she remembers for a few minutes until she finally realizes she is in a seat of the, the row. She's the only one in the seat. The other seats are empty. The plane has broken apart and she is swirling twirling, headed down towards the Amazon forest and the Amazon jungle. 
She blacks out again and she really doesn't remember anything except that she wakes up and she's underneath her seat now. She has fallen nearly two miles from the sky and has landed in underneath her seat. And that is where she finds herself. She kind of comes to and she realizes that her watch is still working and so she looks at it and it's nine o'clock the next morning because of the time frame she would knew and, and be, was able to see that the sun was up and it was nine o'clock the next morning. She realizes, I have just survived a plane crash and I'm in the jungle. She looks around, she can't seem to find anyone. She said it literally took her a couple of hours to, to get through the fog of this consciousness and realize where she was and, and realize that she had survived. And she kind of checked herself out and she realized that her collarbone was broken. She had a, a terrible concussion. She had a bad cut to her back calf and, and one on her back arm that she would find a little bit later. She had one shoe on. Her glasses had been knocked off and so she really couldn't see. One eye was swollen shut and, and there she was in the middle of the jungle all alone. She got out and tried to find, she started calling out for her mother and she couldn't find her anywhere. She started looking around and she couldn't even find other parts of the plane. And she realized, I am alone in this jungle. How am I supposed to survive in this jungle alone? Well, there's a way that she could. And it's because she had two parents that were actually zoologists. And from the age of 14, they had lived in the, in the rainforest, the Amazon jungle. And her parents were Hans and Maria. And they taught her about the jungle. And so you can see in this picture that they're gonna put up here, this is a picture of her parents, and then it's a picture of her actually learning as a young child about the jungle. And she says that she realized that she, and I, I wanna read this quote to you. Um, here's what she says. My parents were zoologists. This is the story from her life. My parents were zoologists, and there was almost nothing they hadn't shown me. I only had to find access to all of this knowledge in my concussion-fogged head because now it was no longer just something I happened to pick up in passing. Now this knowledge was necessary for my survival. This morning, what I want to share with you are a few things that her parents taught her how to survive the jungle. Because parents, mom, dad, young person, it is a jungle out there. I don't have to tell you that. You live in it. it used to, we used to say, when you graduate from college or when you graduate from high school, you're gonna get thrown out into the jungle. That has changed drastically. You are thrown into the jungle in, in elementary school, in high school, High school, the world is a jungle. I don't have to tell us that this morning, but I'm telling you, parents, I'm telling you, young people, there is a way to survive the jungle. And at this moment, Juliana realized that she wanted to get out of the jungle. And the only way that she could get out would be for her to follow what her parents had taught her all of those years. And so I want us to look at those because this is what Juliana did for 11 days in the Amazon rainforest by herself. The first thing that she realized that she needed to do was she remembered, find a stream and follow it. 
She remembered that her parents had told her this. She remembered her parents had taught her this. They said, you need to find a flowing body of water and you need to follow that. Because here's what will happen. If you are in the jungle and you are lost and you cannot find your way out, find a small portion of water that's moving. Because as you go to that water, it's going to lead to deeper water. It's going to lead to another stream. It's going to lead to another river until finally all the river will dump into a large river which will take you to civilization and you will be spared. You will be saved. You will be found if you will follow that river. Find a river. Find a stream and follow it. And so she got up and she started looking and and she would see a little bit of bubbling something somewhere and she would get excited because she thought, there it is, and then it would lead to nothing. And then and then she would listen and, and because she could hear there's a certain bird and because her mother actually was, it's a fancy name for someone who studied birds, that's what her mom actually did. And when she, she so her mom would teach her the different sounds of the birds and there was one particular particular bird and one particular cry of a bird that would live near a body of water so she would listen for that bird so that she could hear it's got to be near water and finally she found just it wasn't even a stream but just just a little bit of water that that would look like it was flowing and, and it would flow around a tree and it was kind of an obstacle and it would flow a little bit further until finally she found a stream 20 inches wide a stream bed and she said when I found the water, I had a goal. I knew what I had to do to attain it. I had to follow the water. And so therefore she followed this bed of water until, until it got thicker, until it got a little bigger, until it got a little wider, until she kept following that stream, until it actually led to a wide river. She said, I needed the water for three reasons. One, I needed the water to refresh me. I needed to be able to drink the water. I needed refreshing. The second reason is it helps you and it keeps you from getting lost in the jungle. If you stay near the water, if you stay in the water, it will keep you from getting lost. You won't get going in circles all the time. You will actually be headed in a direction and it will lead you to civilization. It reminds me of a scripture in Ezekiel. Ezekiel is writing and he is prophesying about the restoration of Jerusalem. And it's, it's, he's talking about in the new Jerusalem, there will be a river that flows from it. And it's really an illustration of salvation. This river will flow and wherever the river flows, the scripture says, where the river flows, life abounds. Where the river flows, life abounds. Do I have to be more clear? Jesus is the living water. He is the water. It is the illustration of salvation. Jesus is saying to you, if you are in the jungle and you are lost and you don't know which way to go and you don't know how to train your children, train your children to find the water. When all else fills, fails, show them how to find Jesus. Show them how to get close to him. Show them that it may just start as a little bit. You may not feel this overwhelming power of God. You may not be able to see the end result. You may not know how you're going to get out, but find just a little bit of Jesus. And that's all it takes. It's just a little bit of his saving power and find it and follow it and follow it. And then it's going to lead to a little bit more and you're going to be refreshed by Jesus and after you're refreshed by Jesus it's going to help you from getting lost because there's going to be people that are going to tell you which way to go and what to do and bring you philosophies and bring you ideas and it can get so confusing but just stay in the water stay with Jesus don't get distracted because you'll get lost and eventually 
there will be salvation. Isaiah 55, 1 says, all you who are thirsty, come to the water. The water is refreshing. You cannot make it in this jungle of life without Jesus. You will not be able to make it. Parents, we have parents that are biological or spiritual parents. We have to teach them to go to the water. We can teach them a lot of things, but if we don't teach them to go to the water, they're going to get lost and they will not survive. Some of you might be saying, Ginger, my kids are gone. I don't have that luxury to teach them anymore. Teach them by living it. Are you going after the water? Are you lost in the jungle? They see it. They know it. You find the water. And when you find the water, they're going to understand how to find the water themselves. So the first thing is, find a stream and follow it. Find the water. Young people, Jesus is the water. There is no other water. There is no other way. Find the water and follow it. The second is know the danger. In the jungle, because she was raised by zoologists, she had a good knowledge of the animals. And she said on this 11-day journey, she ran into every kind of critter that you can imagine. She ran into jaguars. She was sleeping one night, and, and she would be asleep because what she would do is she would get into the water, and, and when the water, when it got big enough, she all day long would walk in the waterbed. Now, to me, that sounds like a craziness, right? The caimans were there, piranhas, stingrays, all of those things are in this jungle. And so I'm thinking, I'm not getting in that water. Or have you lost your ever-loving mind? I am not getting in that water. I can't. See, she's shaking her head no right there. She's like, no, I'm not getting in that water. But what Juliana knew, because her parents had taught her, is the depth of the river is the safest place. Please hear that. The deeper you are in with Jesus, the safer it is. You don't have to be able to see what is below you because he knows and he's with you. So get into the deepest part of the water because piranhas and stingrays really only will strike in the shallow, stagnant water. That's where it's most dangerous is when you're stagnant and you're not moving. And that is where they will strike you. So Juliana, every morning would just get into the middle. She would pass the Caymans. She would walk right by them. She would get in the middle of the river. When it got deep enough, she would just let it float her down the river. She didn't even have to work. She could hold on to a log and it would just take her. But she would get into the river and she would watch the Caymans on the side. At night, she would get out and go to sleep on the riverbed. And she said one night in particular, she could hear near, she said it's pitch black and she could hear what sounded like a jaguar not very far away from her and she knew the sound and she just lay there and she didn't know what would happen and then all of a sudden there was a rustling right here next to her and spiders would crawl over the top of her and there was a rustling next to her and she said I knew what it was by the sound it was a mahas now does anybody here know what a mahas was that's because we don't have them around here in Tennessee <sighs> A mahas is a large rodent the size of a medium-sized dog. And that rodent was right next to her, wrestling around. Here's the deal. Know your danger and face it. When that rodent started wrestling around her, she started making noises and it got scared 
and it ran away. When she was right there laying on the bed one day, there were about five or six little baby came in, about 18 inches long, and she knew I am in trouble. There's a mama came in around here somewhere. She jumped up, went into the water, past the other ones, and got into the middle of the stream where it was safe. Face the big. Don't be afraid of it. I'm telling you right now, Genesis 4, 8 says that sin lies at the door and it desires to have you. Satan isn't playing around. He doesn't hope you accidentally don't make it. He is, th that scripture is so powerful to me. Sin, Satan is at the door and he desires to have you for lunch. He desires to have you. And then do you know what the rest of the verse says? Roll over it. Don't be afraid of it. Face it. We cannot raise our children to be afraid of this world. If we teach them to be afraid of it, then you know what's going to happen. They're going to run and hide. And who is going to proclaim the power of a living God who is greater than the biggest trauma that can come our way? Face the big. Ephesians 6 says, put on the armor of God and go fight. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, we are to be aware of his schemes. She wasn't afraid of the baby Cayman because she knew it was the mama Cayman to be afraid of. And she knew she needed to get away from the baby Cayman. She knew that just by simply making a noise, that rodent would run away. The scripture says in 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, be controlled and alert. She said to the, tr to the untrained eye, you cannot see the animals in the jungle that are around you. But to the trained eye, you know what that anaconda looks like. You know which one's poisonous and which one isn't. To the trained eye. Be controlled. Be alert. For your enemy, the devil, roams around or prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. She was not someone to be devoured. She had decided, I've made it to the water, I'm making it on, and I know the danger that's in the head of me, and I'm not going to stop. I'm going to face the big, resist the enemy, stand firm in the faith. Know the danger, face the big. Know the danger, fear the small. The insects, all of the flies and the mosquitoes. Just imagine that, right? All of the tarantulas that would crawl over her at night. She would just lay there still and they would just crawl over the top of her. And she knew that's what she needed to do. But fear the small. She had this gash on the back of her arm. And this gash, she, she didn't realize it at first for, for the first day or two. And then all of a sudden, the back of her arm started hurting. And when she looked and she turned around to the back, she realized that she had a hole about a, an inch and a half deep. Now she had one on the back of her leg, but neither one of them bled. And, and, and this one was really deep, but it kept getting worse until she turned around and she realized the maggots were in it. Aren't you going to enjoy lunch this afternoon? Happy Mother's Day! <laughs> but maggots were in there, and here's what she knew. There's a fly that will bite and it will lay its larva in when it bites. And she had been taught by her parents that that is what's dangerous. Because this type of larva will dig down. And instead of just eating on the flesh on the outside and going out, 
it burrows down deeper, and when it gets frightened or when it gets alarmed or whatever, it burrows down further. It was actually eating down to her bone, her flesh, and she knew that was dangerous. So she had a little ring, a little cheap ring that you could pull apart, and she took that ring and she pulled it apart, and she started to dig out the maggots out of her arm because she knew if she let that stay, it would destroy her and she would probably lose her arm. For nine days, Juliana would get in the river. She would go down the river at night. She would crawl out to the side. She would sleep. She'd get back in the river. She was starving. She would drink a lot of water because it would make her stomach full, feel full. So much so that one day she knew that the frogs were poisonous, the poisonous little frogs, but she was so hungry and she kept trying to catch them. But she, she knew if I eat that, that's poisonous. I can't do it. It's small, but she was starving. And she said, you know what? I might just go ahead and try it anyway. Can I warn you? Even when you're desperate, don't take the poison. Even when it seems like there's no way out, don't take the easy way. It might just be poison. There's a scripture, Proverbs, that says something to this. This is the ginger translation. That even the honeycomb tastes really good when you're hungry. You don't wait for the honey. You just eat the honeycomb. I'm just going to throw this out there. Young people, old people, any people, don't settle for someone just because you want a boyfriend or a girlfriend and you're afraid to be alone. I'm just throwing that out there. Don't settle. It might be poison. Don't eat something. Don't take a job just because you want the job. Don't give in. Wait for what God has for you. Do not just give in. It might kill you. So that, so for these days, finally she got to this point and and. She was laying on the side of this pretty wide river at this point, and she looked across, and she saw what she thought looked like a boat. She thought, oh my goodness, there's a boat, and she made her way across the river, and sure enough, it was a boat. She looked up this little incline, about 15 or 20 yards, and there was a little hut, and she thought, I finally found someone. She said it took her hours because this has now been nine days without food in the jungle with a broken collarbone, one shoe, which she took the whole journey with one shoe on and one shoe off. And people said, why did you leave it on? And she said, well, at least I would have one foot protected. And she said, what she would do is she would take a stick and, and in, the, in, in the water, she would do a stick and it would scare everything away and, and the flies were biting her. And finally, when she got up and she was exhausted, And she got to this boat and she began to just literally crawl. And she said it took her almost all day to crawl those 15 yards because she was so exhausted. But she got up to the hut. And when she got to the hut, there was no one there. And she tried crawling crawling out. And she could tell it had probably been closed up for the winter. And there was no one there. And she was, oh, I thought I had found it. But she saw something. She saw a little can of gasoline. And she remembered the maggots. And she said, I didn't want to do it, but I knew what I had to do. If I didn't get the maggots out, I was going to be eaten alive. So she poured gasoline into that open wound. And she took that ring and she pulled out about 30 maggots out of her arm The pain was so excruciating that she just finally passed out. 
It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Jealousy, bitterness, an attitude of victimization. I'm not saying you haven't been a victim. I'm saying an attitude of it. Pride. It's the little things that bite you. And then they start working their way down in until they take root, until they're deep down in there. Until when it's time for you to pull it out, it's too painful to pull it out, so you just let it stay in. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. She woke up the next morning on the 10th day, actually the 10th the afternoon of the 10th day, to voices. And there were three hunters who that was their hut, and they were just coming to check on things. And they found Juliana. They were scared to death of her. She had been sunburned so bad that her flesh was peeling off of her. her all of the blood vessels in her eyes had popped, and her eyes were completely red. Now, keep in mind, this is in the Peruvian jungle, so most are dark-skinned. She was fair, fair fair-skinned, blonde hair, red eyes, peeling skin. Not, and and I forgot to mention, she had just saved her money to buy her a little mini skirt, because it was 1971, and she had a little tiny thin mini skirt on, and that's what she went through the jungle in. And so when they saw her, they were scared to death. There is a goddess in the uh, jungle, they think, of the river. And so they thought that they had come in contact with the goddess of the jungle. (laughs) And they were scared. And she began to speak to them in their language and shared with them what had happened. They gathered her. It was too late that night to get on on the... boat, but they eventually, the next morning, put her in a boat, and they took her down the river about, I think it was about eight hours, until they could get to a location, and when they got her to this location, again, people were so frightened of her, and and they got her in, and they put her on a plane. Imagine that. They put her on a plane to fly her to a hospital, and there's a picture of her looking out the window. She doesn't look as horrible as you would think in this picture, but they say it was just awful. She was looking out the window trying to just grasp all of this, and they landed, and they took her into the hospital. And when they got into the hospital, there was a man who came into the room, and it was her father. Can I just say to you, She didn't know if anybody even knew where she was. But she had a father who every day had been going, have you heard anything about my child? Have you heard anything about my wife? Have you heard anything? Did anybody survive? Are they okay? Can I tell you today, there's a father He's a good father. And every day the sun comes up and he says, I've got a child that's lost out there. Are you going to come home today? Am I going to see you today? I'm going to give you mercy enough for today. Just like the prodigal son, he was there. He wanted to be there with his daughter because he was concerned about her. And so they reunited, and of course, there were no other survivors. Juliana had survived disappointments. She had heard the planes going over her. She survived it. She survived the obstacles, and she survived the injuries. Can I just tell you, don't give up. If you're a young person, if you're an adult and you're in the jungle, don't give up. Don't quit. Find the river, follow it, 
Get rid of the junk inside that could kill you. Eventually, after she was saved and several years went by after some trauma of going through this ordeal, she went back and this is a picture of her looking at the wreckage. She went back and they actually made a documentary of her time going back to the wreckage. Her parents, of course her mother passed and then her father passed at some point. And she decided to become a zoologist. And where do you think she went back to? The Peruvian jungle. And there is there today the Panguana Foundation and Research Center. And guess who runs it? Juliana. Parents, don't give up. There is a heritage that you have. Have faith. Your kids may be in the jungle today, lost. Keep praying. Keep believing. Keep trusting. So when you think about it, what are the measurements of the Amazon? This one girl dropped from the sky, lost. And, and they realized that that area that she was lost in really was uninhabited. No one would have ever found her had she not gone out. As a matter of fact, she knew that jungle so well, she marked it all along the way and she made mental notes that she was able to tell them how to get to the plane wreckage. And they went back and that's where they discovered that there were quite a few people that they believed that actually survived the plane crash. They were all kind of in a little camp but they didn't know what to do. So they just sat there and waited for someone to come find them. They died because they gave up. Don't just sit there. Get up. Don't quit. Keep going. The Amazon is 1,550 miles long and 2,240 miles wide. That's as far basically from LA to New York and Minnesota to Texas. And one girl was lost in that. But she found her way out. Kind of reminds me of the fact that no Psalm 139, where it says, where can I go from your presence? If I go to the heavens, the psalmist, he, he didn't know ab about east and west as far as that kind of thing goes like we know today. The psalmist just says, where can I go from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I go to the depths of hell, you are there. Where can I run away from you? It doesn't matter how big the jungle that you are in doesn't matter he's there you cannot run away from him you may be that I believe in with all of my heart there are people who are listening to me either by by uh, our, our video and and I, I just messed all that up you're watching <sighs> or if you're in this room I believe with all my heart there are some of you that are lost in the jungle and you don't know what to do so you're just sitting by the crash, waiting for someone to come pick you up. Can I say to you, you have not gone beyond God's love. You have not gone past it. He's calling out to you to come to the water. Ephesians 3, 18 and 19. This Bible, my daughter got yesterday at graduation at Lee. 
as far as I know back, Dr. Kahn and Dr. Walker have signed this as of yesterday's graduation, but inscribed in that is Ephesians 3, 16 through 19. And I think I get it even more now. Why that's inscribed there? Because when you leave Lee, when you leave college, when you leave high school, when you leave a place, it doesn't matter where you go. You cannot go past the love of Christ. You can't go further than it. And, and this verse is Paul saying, I want you to understand as God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep God's love is. He says, I want you to get it. You're gonna need this, Paul says. And then I laugh because then he says, it's too great to fully understand. I want you to understand this, but you're not going to be able to because of the love of God. So what? Thanks, Ginger, for sharing us this little story. And you can read the book. You can watch the documentary. So what? It's Mother's Day. What? 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 Here's, here's what. Number one. If you're a person lost into the jungle this morning, come to the water. It's not too late. Number two, young people, old people, all people, follow the stream. Face the big. You have Jesus Christ inside of you. Face the big. Fear the small and don't give up. Number three, moms of younger children particularly, start now. Teach them the water. I saw a meme the other day that said, I'm trying to get my child to heaven, not to Harvard. I think we may have gotten that a little confused sometimes. I'm trying to get my child a scholarship for sports. I'm trying to get my child a scholarship for ballet. I'm trying to just make my child be happy. Forget it. Just get them to heaven. If they make it through Harvard on their way, praise God, they can be a light. If they get to be a pro athlete, hallelujah, he's given them a platform. Get them to heaven. Because if they get to Harvard and never make it to heaven, we've lost them in the jungle. Number four, moms who have children in the jungle. Don't give up. Don't quit.